let's switch gears. You know, we don't want to be tearing down standards all the time. We want to be talking about what does the science tell us about what we ought to be doing out here to protect water quality in this landscape. So let's talk about what we can do in terms of managing. And so this is a photo of the field station. And through the annual rangeland system, the irrigated pasture system, and that's what I'm going to talk about in terms of practices that can improve runoff from these two systems. And so start with a, a system up in the, a little higher in the mountains. Real common in places like the Upper Pitt, the Upper Feather River, over the east side of Sierra Nevada, are kind of stream diversion-based irrigated meadows. You've got a stream flowing along, somebody's got a diversion on it, diverts water out into a ditch, along the top of a field, floods out over it, irrigates it, water comes back, and eventually goes back to the creek. Sometimes it comes back in one spot, sometimes it comes back all along the creek. This is a real common type of, of irrigated pasture system in three, four thousand feet and above elevation. And so we conducted a survey of ten of these systems. One to understand what was going on in terms of just the fundamentals that we see, but also to try and understand when we see phenomena like this, we got a stream flowing along. This is a real world example. All summer long, stream flows along, branch A diverts, irrigates, water comes back. The branch B picks up that water, irrigates, water goes back. We look at E. coli levels, commensal E. coli levels, going from 52 to 1,000 to 1300. You wonder why is there such a dramatic increase here compared to here? What is this? What's the management here that's leading to that increase compared to the management here that's leading to a relatively low increase? Can we get some clue about what we ought to be doing out there? If you look at all 10 of these sites, streets 1 through 10, I rank them from, if we compare the change in concentration of E. coli, TSS, conductivity, if we look at what's below, Subtract what's above, that's a net change. Negative number for, say, E. coli indicates these three streams were a sink for E. coli, or these three meadows were a sink for E. coli. They tracked it. These ones didn't have a lot of change, and these, the bottom, 8 to 10, were a source. And so there's a, man, there's a response gradient that we hope is due to mention. See some similar patterns in TSS, holes in solids. Conductivity, but you really see the signature in E. coli. And so why is that? Well, if we, while we're out there working with those ranchers over the course of the season, not only did we sample the water above and below, but we also asked them, what's your management in terms of how much water do you put onto the field? What's the rate of application in terms of, say, cubic feet per second per acre? So it's the rate of application, which will dictate the rate of runoff. And if we look at the model that statistically, looking at the effect of that variable on E. coli concentration, downstream, is, uh, upstream is the blue, which is it's above this activity, so it's not dependent on it, but flat. Downstream, we see that as we increase the amount of application of water, and thus the runoff from those fields, we see a, an exponential increase in the concentration of E. coli below. So just pure transport capacity. So one management option is to decrease runoff, to try and reduce the amount of water coming off that field, going back to the stream. That makes a lot of sense. These are said and done. But if we can reduce that hydrologic transport capacity, we'll see a benefit in stream E. coli levels. And we'll see this consistently as we go through these, these types of presentations. Looking at stocking rates. So ask them, what's your stock density? How many animals were out there when you were irrigating? And did you have cattle on while you were irrigating? Animal unit per acre, animal units of cow, one cow. And so if we increase the stocking rate, the number of animals per acre, looking at the downstream site, you see as we get above one and a half or so, 1.2 cows per acre in our stock density, we see a really dramatic increase in the concentration of E. coli. So trying to achieve some moderate stocking rates, as a put it, it's even just, just a half of a animal unit per acre increase right in here gives you a, a order of magnitude increase. So at some point we really trigger a lot of direct deposition of fecal material and a lot of E. coli downstream. So moderate stocking rates, and if you have livestock in the field when you're irrigating, you can as much as double the amount of E. coli coming off the field as if you don't have cattle in the field when you're irrigating. 
Most producers like to take the cattle out of the field when you're irrigating, just due to the issues with damage to irrigation ditches and what have you. Not everybody has that option, but it is an option. That can work. So managing your runoff volume, or you managing your irrigation application, managing your stocking rates, keeping it moderate if possible, and then managing um, the timing of raising relative to the timing of irrigation are three tools that we've got pretty good management scale evidence for work. And these are all logical. Implementing them to be critical. So if we look now down here a little lower at the foothill and valley flood irrigated pastures that we see around here and down close to the Sacramento, we've conducted a suite of studies here at the field station, looking at that as well as on some private ranches down lower. And looking at opportunities to use rotational grazing to basically disconnect grazing from irrigation events, back to that topic I talked about, reducing cattle in the field when you irrigate, giving them a rest before you irrigate, and that irrigation application rate to minimize tailwater generation, less runoff, less equal water. Less everything else as well. So this will work for most other constituents. We've been focusing on the coal because that tends to be the most problematic variable to see. If we look here at the Sierra Field Station, we'll take you to this field. We're not irrigating it now, obviously, but we can, we can show it to you. Um, we found pretty clearly that if you look at over about 16 irrigation events with variable levels of irrigation application rate and thus variable levels of tailwater runoff rate, CFS per acre, um, Looking at E. coli concentration, as we increase the rate of runoff on these fields, we have a pretty strong increase in E. coli concentration in the tailwater. So confirming at a smaller scale, at a more controlled scale, where we could actually at the same site look at multiple runoff rates, we found that same opportunity to manage E. coli transport and nutrient transport by trying to minimize overall tailwater. Now in irrigated field, we're always going to generate some tailwater, or you're not going to irrigate the bottom of it. So there's going to be some runoff. Trying to keep that value as low as possible is one option to reduce nutrient transport. <coughs> Same thing with what we saw earlier in terms of field grazing management. We ran trials. I drove our herds been insane. So many cows around out there. But basically, we, we had irrigations where cattle were in the field, zero days less from grazing before irrigation, looking at equal light again all the way up to a month's rest before we irrigated. And numbers all along there. Fit a line through that. I basically found kind of an exponential reduction. As we rest the field from grazing before we irrigate, we see lower and lower levels in the coal line. This is why I'm not before lunch anymore. <laughs> I always put an appetite there. I think juicy, juicy coal line excretion. We look at what's going on in that fecal path. What's going on out there? It hits the ground. What's happening to the E. coli that are in? They're having a bad couple of days. If you look at fecal pad age, from brand new, just hit the ground inside of the cow, to one, two, three, four, five, seven days old, out there in the blazing 110 degree weather that we get here, on your big pasture in summer. Looking at the E. coli concentration, times a million in that fecal pad, put it out there, put Put seven of them out there and every day harvest one, basically, and see what's left alive. And what we find initially is some growth within that pad. It's moist, there's a lot of nutrients, a lot of carbon in there, not a bad place to be. It starts to grow. All of a sudden, it starts to get hot, it starts to dry out, and you get a real crash in the population. And out about four or five days, we see consistently that we get down to a very low level of E. coli left alive in the fecal pad. So if you irrigate right in here, when cows are in the field, and you've got one and two and three day old packs populating the field, you can see these high levels of E. coli available to be washed off. You can wait a few days, even just a couple, before you irrigate, and let the system kill a lot of this E. coli for you. That's why that rotational grazing is working. And you get crusting, right? So not just mortality, but the fecal pack gets a crust on it, it becomes harder to erode. Um, more difficult to do. Okay, on rangelands during winter, or excuse me, rangelands during summer, uh, this case is actually late summer, or, or excuse me, late fall, uh, late summer, early fall, we found consistently across the state, looking at sea parvum, the pathogen that we're interested in, that if we put 
thermometers in the least fecal pads. That's what you get working with a parent. Now they put thermometers in the fecal pad and minutely measure the temperature changes every hour. We found that a fecal pad in the sun, this line over the course of a day, will go well up over 100 degrees, come back down. Next day, go well up, come back down. And we found that if air temperature exceeds 78 degrees Fahrenheit, fecal pad temperature tends to exceed 140 degrees Fahrenheit on average. And that leads to complete mortality of all the C. parvovosis in that fecal pad. And it's not that they're um, dying. What's happening is as that fecal pad passes through the temperature range of my body, your body, the cow's body, the egg kind of gets tricked. It, it's temperature induced. It hatches. It hatches in the fecal pad, and it's not a good condition. It's very, it can survive a long time in the shell, but once it hatches, it's very vulnerable. And needs to be in, in, a, in a GI tract, in the intestine. So you get a lot of false extinctics, uh, false hatching, I'm sure that word. And uh, that's probably what's going on, because we see under the microscope a lot of hatch eggs. <coughs> so we think it's really going on. So, you know, just a few days rest from grazing can give you a, a bit of a cleaning and autoclaving, if you will, with that range, of that range during the summer. But in the winter, they can survive a long time because temperatures are lower. Looking at what that does on rangeland, again, even under, under winter conditions, if we look at, we've got a fecal pad out there, we've got rainfall occurring on it, I have a cartoon in every talk. Uh, my fecal pad, I've got the soil profile under here, get some grass. If we look at what's coming out of that fecal pad during rain over many, many storms, sampling the runoff a meter below, the yard, we find that as fecal, as fecal pad age increases out there, even this time of year, we'll see a, a dramatic reduction in E. coli, as well as in um, cryptos putting parvo over that time period. So rotational grazing, even in the green season here, on annual range, has some opportunity to, to allow some mortality. So if you're down in a riparian field, you've got a big storm system coming, you might be able to get out of that a couple days earlier and let a little bit of mortality occur and reduce the levels that you would see in the stream during that storm event. Location is really important, and this gets at livestock distribution on rangelands. We're finding that, and I'll talk more about this later, the same scenario, we're finding that greater than 90% of all these bad bugs are stuck within the fecal path or one foot below. The vast majority of them never leave the path and never get more than a foot away. That's because, as you know, if you go out on rangeland, a fecal path doesn't disappear over the course of the winter. The vast majority of it's still there. And so are many of the constituents that are in it. If we look at the yard or the meter below that, an additional 30 to 90 percent is trapped within that meter. So what does get out? There's an additional immense trapping within just one yard. So then, if we think about it that way, rather than thinking about buffers and buffer distance, which is one option, thinking about where livestock are distributing themselves in the manure across the landscape. Anything we can do, be it supplemental feeding, herding, um, cross-fencing, to pull livestock out of the bottom of the creeks, the bottom of the valleys, and up into the uplands, will let the entire range act as a buffer. Because every, every fecal pad that's up, 90% is trapped. And then for every additional meter that is up, whether it's being raised below it or not, you get another 30 to 90%. So spatial and temporal distribution of feces is good. And so we've got to keep that out of the creek. We know that. Even just a couple yards back, there's orders of magnitude less than directly in the creek. So we've got to really deal with that issue uh, as best we can. And that's problematic. There's no doubt about it. But we need to be aware and fight it. We look at what we can do with um, livestock attractants. What can we do with water, off-site water, away from the creek, shade, will attract cattle at this landscape in the summer, a supplement where we're putting out salt, where we're putting out mineral. If we look down the San Joaquin Range, a um, study we did looking at fecal loading by cattle on watershed about 300 acres. We had plots where we measured loading of feces in the wet season and the dry season at 0 to 10% slope in the same watershed, up to 20%. 20 to 30, really steep ground, what we call the riparian area, a variable source area, and then where we had a livestock attractant. If you look at the, the red, the dry 
high season. They like those lower areas where they could, the flatter areas, so there's a little feed left in some of those soils and pull them in there in the summer. But otherwise, there wasn't a, a really big distribution, difference in distribution um, between these sites. There was a little bit more in various vertical source area. But if you look at the effect of water, salt, shade on feces distribution by cattle, it was immense. So, simple thing. Where do you put your supplement lot? Where do you put your off-site water? These things really will affect water quality, the data to demonstrate that. If you've got a stream right here, don't put your salt block right there. If you've got a stream down here and supplement up here, maybe it's a long way away, this is down South Team Range, you can see that the trail that the cattle use to walk up to the supplement during a storm event is a little river. And so the best of intentions, salt block's way up on the hill, but because of the way they're trailing, everything from the salt block during the storm event is running right down and getting into the tree. So some management of those kinds of things. Uh, just taking those into effect as, as we manage our talk in this landscape, these simple set of tools can have a lot of positive impact. If we do all of these things, then we'll probably worry about something else. Some other land use, to be, to be quite honest with you. If we get most ranchers aware of these things and at least thinking about them every so often in their day to day activity. Looking at um, kind of a um, an issue of just grazing pressure. Remember I talked about stocking rate on irrigated pasture and how that affected E. coli transfer. We've done some studies looking at bulk density, the, the compaction. The higher the bulk density, the more compacted and the less able the soil is to take water. We looked from long-term no grazing all the way up to right around the corral or the feeding station. You can see those high use areas are very compacted. Then if we look at Randy Park about REM, from a high REM to a from a high RDM to a low RDM, from high grazing to low grazing, we can see that as we get into moderate and heavy grazing, we do have some compaction of the soil relative to moderate. And, and this is what we kind of recommend that we here, the university and, and the NRCS. And so heavy grazing will compact the soil and potentially lead to greater runoff and greater transport capacity. When we look at residual dry matter, and we'll go to these plots today, so if we've got, in October, 200 pounds, of forage out there on the plot, up to 1,000, we see that if you look at E. coli flux, we see a net decrease. So more ground cover from 200 to 1,000 pounds of cover, vegetative cover, we see a reduction in E. coli that will come off of that site. More infiltration, more filtration, those types of things. However, we had treatments where we didn't harvest any of the forage, and this is one of those, for five, six years, where we accumulate up to 4,000 pounds per acre of forage, and we see for those plots an actual increase, a reversal, to the point where the amount of E. coli coming off of these unclipped plots is equal to the heavily clipped plots. And so I think what's going on there is we have environmental growth and survival. We have nutrients, we have a little better microclimate, we have some moisture, we have attractants for wildlife, uh, varmint, vermin, and other small wildlife that might be coming in, that E. coli. And so not managing this forage is probably not an option for maximizing E. coli reduction. Some level of moderate use is probably ideal for balancing the need for livestock production and the need to minimize E. coli transport off of these systems. And so, kind of to summarize that, move on to Toby. For irrigated pastures, reduce runoff rates. Try to achieve moderate stocking rates. Try to remove cattle before irrigation and allow at least a few days for mortality of these microbes and crusting. The crusting will benefit us from a nutrient perspective as well as a microbial perspective. It's also good for the field and the soil. And then, as always, avoid direct nutrient deposition of people and urine whenever possible. Looking on annual rangeland systems, a little less intensive management, fewer options, but we're definitely looking at moderate, moderate stocking rates for many reasons, this being one of them. Make sure when we're putting livestock attractants that they're, they're away from the stream and they're achieving the desired effect, which is to move the manure from the stream to the upland and break that hydrologic connection between the two. Uh, if trailing is, is, is undoing that, then we have to look at ways to deal with trailing effects. And then, wherever possible, timing the pasture use to allow mortality and crusting before runoff events, before the wet season. If you've got a really vulnerable riparian field, you might want to use that field um, late summer, early fall, and then get out of it, let a lot of that material die that's in the feces. 
let the rainfall season come and go, and then use it again a little later in the spring after the hydrologic risk is, is passed. So just thinking about timing. Yep. Ken, earlier you mentioned that there's often runoff from irrigated pasture fields, and I guess that's assuming then um, flood irrigation. There are times when it's appropriate to convert to sprinkler, yeah. and then you'd have much less runoff and therefore reduce the risk yeah. quite a lot as well. That's right. You know, there's, as the irrigator here will tell you, as, and as you probably know, there's a lot more um, maintenance and effort involved in maintaining the irrigated system. They clog, they break, cows like to rub on. And so there are some increased management options, issues with that. But if you can reduce that runoff to a sprinkler, and you probably use less water as well, um, that is a good option. So I, what I might do, since we're running a little late on time and we want to make sure we're right for lunch, at, during lunch, we can, you guys ask any questions you have, and then, of course, over the course of the afternoon. Um, but I'm going to try to move on to Toby and make sure he's got enough time to, to talk to you a bit about more about nutrients and these other decisions. Thank you.